Hi, my name is Irene Davis, and I'm the president of Trustees of Sandwich Beaches. I want to welcome you to our show, Sandwich, It's Not the Same Without the Sand. Our guest today is Dr. Scott Melvin, who is a senior biologist or zoologist from the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Good um, to be here. Great, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, maybe just talk a little bit about the mission of your organization and maybe your role that you play in this group. Sure. As you said, I work for the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, which is a program of the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. So our agency is responsible for conserving uh, the wildlife and natural resources of the Commonwealth. Our Natural Heritage Program is focused specifically on conservation for rare and endangered animals, plants, and natural communities. Okay. And how about your role? What, have you, what, what role do you play there? Well, I've worked with a whole variety of, of uh, endangered animals, but currently almost all of my efforts are focused on endangered birds, and much of those efforts have to do with conserving endangered coastal water birds. Okay, and so in particular, the least terns and the plovers. Species like so. piping plovers, least terns, uh, some species that aren't state listed but are still rare, regionally like the American oyster catcher. Okay. So I know, um, you know our, our show is really about beach erosion, and there's a lot of concern about losing the beach, about the overwashes, and I know that that has to be balanced with the preservation of the habitat. And I'm wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about what um, those birds, what kind of habitat those birds like. Yeah, let me back up a little bit. Sure. Uh, by way of background, a lot of our conservation efforts within our program are focused on the piping plover. Piping, piping plover is uh, the rarest species of breeding shorebird in North America. It's really a rare species. We currently estimate probably no more than 8,000 wow. birds in all of North America. Wow. Uh, that includes a Great Plains population, a small Great Lakes population, and an Atlantic Coast population, which currently is estimated between Oh, 1,750 to 1,800 breeding pairs distributed all the way from North Carolina to Newfoundland during the breeding season. So it's really an uncommon bird with a very wide, narrow breeding distribution. For nesting and raising chicks when the birds are back on the breeding grounds, remember these are migratory birds, they're down in the Bermudas, uh, Bahamas right now for the winter, uh, they require sandy beaches and dunes for foraging and for nesting and raising chicks. And so they're very much dependent upon natural processes of beach and dune erosion and accretion for maintaining habitat that's relatively low in elevation and unvegetated or sparsely vegetated. I find that really interesting because I know that um, I always thought that the birds were nesting in the dunes. You know, they, they, they fenced off the dunes, and you know, I always thought that they liked sort of the, the hills of the dunes, but mm -hmm. that's not really true, is it? Well, they will nest in the dunes, and you, you get some nests that are back in the dunes, but generally they won't nest in terribly dense vegetation. So the majority of birds we find nesting either on the outer beach, on the upper beach, above the high tide line, yep or in areas that have been, have been eroded back into the dunes, either by wave action or wind action. And you will find some nests up on the vegetated fore dune or occasionally back in dunes, but generally on low dunes and not real steep dunes. So what are the, um, what are the risks to these birds? Or what are the, I know there are predatory animals, there's weather. Maybe you could talk about some of those different um, um, factors that really put these birds at risk. The primary factors that uh, reduce reproduct reproductive success, and of course that's one of the major things that we are con as conservationists working with the birds on the, the breeding grounds are concerned about. Uh, factors that cause either loss of eggs or loss of chicks would be predation. That's the biggest one. Yeah. And basically everything that, that runs or flies on the beach uh, seems to eat eggs of piping plovers or least terns. So for example, what do we have here? The top predators in Massachusetts on plover and least tern nests would be uh, striped skunks, red fox, eastern coyote, uh, crows, and gulls. But we've also documented predation on either eggs or chicks by uh, opossum, raccoon, mink, rats, wow. crackles, 
They all like cats, them, huh? Dogs. You had a deer step on a nest once. Wow. All right, so we have animal predators. So predation is probably the biggest one, uh, given all the management that's in place now. Overwash from high tides, particularly storm-driven high tides. Um, that was particularly a problem this past summer. We may have a chance to talk about that more. Yeah. Uh, loss and degradation of habitat, primarily due to human activities within the coastal zone. So that could be actual development of beaches or dunes, uh, various uh, coastal stabilization activities, which we'll be getting into as well, I presume. Mm -hmm. And then just the whole gamut of uh, impacts from human rec recreation, disturbance to the birds, and direct mortality to eggs or chicks from uh, dogs, people inadvertently disturbing birds off nests, inadvertently stepping on eggs, uh, off-road vehicle use. I would point out that we feel like the adverse effects from recreation are much reduced from what they were 20 or 25 years ago. Well, that's good to hear. It's been so much of the focus of the, the management efforts that so many cooperators and landowners have been involved with over the past couple of decades. Right. I know that you and someone from the Audubon Society today and a couple of the trustees of Sandwich Beaches members walked the beach. You, you uh, braved the wind and rain today. I'm wondering what you found, what you saw. And were there any things that surprised you since you've last been here? Um, well, of course, we saw what is just a, a really uh, nice beach dune uh, estuary out there that we know from all the monitoring work that has been done over the years. Uh, supports a number of nesting piping plovers and lease turns when they return this spring. Uh, we saw some additional erosion through the dunes eastward of the parking lot at Town Neck Beach. Um, I guess that, that would yeah. primarily describe it. So what's, what's interesting is that what you see when you see that is this is a great environment for these, for these birds. And so some of us <coughs> see that and go, oh my gosh, we're going to lose this beach. Um, and I'm wondering, there's got to be a way that we can somehow balance the need to protect our habitat and the need to pres preserve our beach. Um, I'm sure you have some ideas on that. Mm -hmm. I think that's very doable. And I guess first to expand upon my observations this afternoon. Sure. Uh, you know, I saw areas that I know birds have used for nesting in the past. I saw some small areas of habitat. How do you know that they're, they use them? From 25 plus years of watching what they use uh, in a general and specific sense. And then realize that we have a whole network of cooperators in Massachusetts and up and down the coast and in Canada that are out monitoring the birds every summer. Yes. So for example, for most of the sandwich beaches, that monitoring is done by the Massachusetts Audubon Society, uh, partially with support provided by the town of Sandwich. And so they collect and we receive every year records showing essentially where every pair of piping plovers is nesting and where all the least turns are nesting. So we really have a good data set going back a couple of decades to tell us where the birds have been and what they'll use for habitat. What I also saw out there was a beach that clearly is very sand starved. Lots of areas that are too steep, too rocky, too cobbly to support nesting plovers or least turns or to be utilized by the chicks. So certainly a situation that if more sand could be put out there with the proper design could be very beneficial to the birds, I think, and I suspect also meet concerns that folks have about beach erosion. So let's talk about that a little bit because I know that the town, um, through their work with Woods Hole Group, have come up with um, an initial sort of um, proposal <coughs> to realign the inlet of the, the creek um, and also to nourish the beach. And, and I know that they've kind of gone forward as sort of two projects together, um, but I think that in the past, one of the concerns of your organization has been this inlet. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what those concerns are so that we can understand that more. Sure. Well, first of all, I don't know, our, our agency doesn't know what, if anything, is on the table at this point. I'm I, thinking I back to 2002. Let's right. see if so, we even go back there. Sure. So the, the last proposal that we saw for work out there at Town Neck Beach and at the inlet was a proposal to stabilize the inlet. And as it was presented back then, that would require uh, redredging an old inlet and armoring both sides of that 
So basically the eastern end of Town Neck Beach and the western tip of Spring Hill Beach right. would be truncated and armored. Our concern is that essentially everywhere that you see armored inlets when like this. When you say armored, what do you mean by that? Rock uh, jetties. Okay. So you take an accreting or a relatively natural sand spit and sand and gravel flats, dredge those out, put an armored jetty on both sides. And wherever we see that done along the Massachusetts coastline or going north into Maine or south through the Atlantic coast, that basically degrades the habitat for these birds that depend on these spits for, for nesting habitat and for foraging habitat. Maybe for our, our viewers, you could explain that a little bit more. So you've got these two jetty-like structures mm -hmm. that are the entrance to this. Is it because each one of them sort of captures the sand and doesn't let it come through? I mean, why is it that it, it, it degrades that habitat? Well, depending on the situation, it can physically occupy otherwise suitable nesting habitat. It can block access to intertidal areas that are used for feeding. It can block movements of birds trying to get from intertidal feeding habitat on the front beach to the back beach. Now in a situation where one of these revetments, if it traps substantial amount of sand, could be a good thing. That could be a good thing or at least a, a neutral thing. But our concern was, based on the, the plan that we were seeing back in 2002, it would have an overall negative adverse effect. We were almost maybe more concerned about adverse effects to the low-lying spit at the western end of Spring Hill Beach, which is probably the, the best nesting habitat in this whole system, and what would, would happen to that habitat in both the short and the long term if the proposal back 10 years ago went forward. Right. Is there in your mind, an ideal sort of compromise when it comes to the opening of the, of the inlet? Because you know it's shifted, mm -hmm. um, and it certainly has widened. Um, and I, I'm obviously not a coastal engineer, so I don't really know the science behind that and mm -hmm. what the consequences are. Certainly appears to me, and this is just a layperson's observation, having grown up here, that there's more water. It appears there's more water. We're getting much more flooding, at least, mm -hmm. in, the, in the creek. So it seems like something might need to be done. So is there some kind of compromise that you think could be done? Or do you think it just needs to be allowed to just go its natural way? Well, realize I'm not a coastal engineer or coastal geologist either. So really... So we need to bring one of those right, in. Right, exactly. That'll be your next show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all I can do really as a, uh, an ornithologist and an endangered bird biologist is try to understand and render an opinion on what effects proposals will have on the bird habitat. Realize within our agency, within Mass Fish and Wildlife, uh, we're working with, within a, uh, a regulatory program. And we are, uh, one of our responsibilities is to administer the rare species habitat provisions of the State Wetlands Protection Act, functioning as a scientific authority working uh, with the State Devi Department of Environmental Protection, and then also administering our State Endangered Species Act, MISA. Uh, I can certainly envision designs that would put a lot of sand on sandwich beaches and have a beneficial effect for the birds, or at worst, a neutral effect. Maybe we could talk about that. Sure. Uh, one option would be basically extending the front beach seaward mm -hmm. and filling in sand essentially out to the extent of all of those jetties that start at the old inlet and extend to the west all the way past Town Neck Beach. And you'd start essentially at the, at the dune or somewhere at the, near the toe of the fore dune and just in a gradual slope way out. Um, my understanding, talking to coastal geologists over the years, is that the preferred design for trying to reduce uh, storm damage is not a high, steep dune, but a long, wide, gradually sloping landform that can reduce wave energy gradually. And that is what is going to be best for the birds, too. Ideally, we want something that can be 
periodically slightly overwashed enough to not let it grow into really dense vegetation, but not something that's real big and steep and then it's going to be scarped by wave energy. Right. Now I know that you have um, been involved in the permitting of a number of projects. Plum Island, I think, was one that you've mentioned. Maybe the vineyard. Have you been involved in the vineyard? I know they've done some, some work over there as well. Yeah, well, I think that's an important point. Realize that uh, we have been able in recent years to uh, sign off on several beach nourishment programs. Uh, so it's not like you're against beach nourishment. Well, no. And again, looking at the, the sandwich beaches, they are clearly starved by sand. Yeah. As I understand it, it's due primarily to the effects of the breakwaters at the right. eastern end of the Cape Cod Canal, and that is just blocking sediment transport moving. And it's pretty obvious from an overhead view of it that that's what's happening. Right. Yeah. So one of the things, every time I go out to these beaches and walk them, I mean, we have birds nesting there, but I see a lot of cobble, large gravel in the intertidal zone, and I'm always thinking, boy, if there was more sand on these beaches in the right design, this could be beneficial to the birds, potentially more nesting habitat and better foraging habitat for the piping plover chicks. So we have uh, signed off through our permitting process over the past five years on beach nourishment projects on Plum Island in Newburyport, um, a town beach in Truro, a privately owned beach in Mashpee, another privately owned beach uh, out in Edgartown. All of these are plover nesting sites and then a lot of smaller beaches in uh, Harwich recently. Now Truro is definitely known for having some high dunes, although I'm sure there's lots of erosion going on there as well. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Because obviously the high dunes are not what they like. Right. You've got enough of the, the flat overwash areas. Is that how you deal with that in, in, in a, an environment that has lots of high dunes? Well, I think uh, that's a good example to look at. The, the beach we're referring to is Cornhill Beach in Truro. Yep. It's on the north uh, side of the mouth of the Pamet River. For starters, I think that would be another example where the hardening of an inlet has degraded the habitat on both sides, right where those breakwaters are. But we've seen that adverse effect lessen to some extent by uh, several years of dredging material from the channel, from the Pamet River, and depositing that on a long, wide, relatively low shelf extending north from the mouth of the river. And that has been placed in such a way, and we've continued to work with the engineers in the town to make sure each year it's designed and carried out in such a way that it continues to create habitat that's wide enough, flat enough, unvegetated enough, and hopefully low enough that the birds will continue to use it. So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute and ask you, we've got this really nice flat area over on the west end of Spring Hill Beach that is an ideal place for the plovers. Mm -hmm. Why not let them just go there? Um, you know, would, would, they, would the numbers increase if we didn't try to preserve them on a beach that right now is really at a tipping point? We've got storms coming through. We're losing some of the, you know, the overwashes are getting deep to the point where they might end up flooding in some mm -hmm. of these summer storms. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to direct the, the, the plovers to places that are really a better environment for them. There's a lot less human traffic in that particular part of Spring Hill. Mm -hmm. Well, realize we're dealing with regulatory performance standards that dictate to some extent how we view projects and render regulatory opinions. Um, but having said that, I think your question catalyzes in my mind the need for a discussion. Okay. You know, what exactly is the proposal and is there a way to do that and still not adversely affect the bird habitat, and potentially even benefit the bird habitat? So in the case of the overwashes that we saw today, yeah. I think there, there would be an option to put some sand in those overwashes if that was a proposal. Yep. If it was done in a way that didn't increase the elevation or the steepness so much that the birds wouldn't use it. Now, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, if that could be done in context with putting sand out on the front beach, seaward of those overwashes, that makes it even easier, at least from the point of view of being able to say that's not an adverse effect to bird habitat. Now, these birds fly. 
Yeah. Right? So why do they need it to be flat? I mean, they can fly over these dunes, right? Mm -hmm. So why is it that they need it to be very flat? Because well, they want, you want them to be able to get from the ocean to the other side. Right. You, you need to have a situation where the chicks can physically get to foraging areas uh, on vegetation. It's for the babies. Yeah, yeah. the chicks. Mm -hmm. Realize these are what we call precocial young. They're up and running around mm -hmm. feeding themselves literally within hours after hatching. Wow, they're didn't not, know that. Yeah, they're not like robins or that, that stay in a nest and are fed and brooded by the, by the adults for yeah. a couple of weeks. So they're up and moving. So they have to be able to get to foraging habitat, which starts out on the upper beach, the edge of the vegetation, but in short order, they want to get down to the wet sand. And ideally, they'd like to have the opportunity to feed in a variety of locations. So if the tide is lower on the back side than the front side, it may be beneficial for them to be able to get under the back side of the beach. If you've got gulls or crows or people with dogs on the back side now, it may be beneficial to be able to run to the front side. In terms of nesting habitat, these are birds that have evolved over literally hundreds of thousands of years to nest in very specific types of habitat. In the case of piping plovers and least terns, for better or worse, it's just above the high tide line in areas with no vegetation or very sparse vegetation. In part, it may have to do with being able to detect predators, see them from a distance. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So if we were to look at Cape Cod, where have we been most successful in this um, program? I'd have to say statewide. Okay, good. Yeah, it's... Um, there are a lot of people who have been working really hard over the past 25 years uh, to pr protect these birds. Uh, we've been able to go in this state from roughly 130 pairs when we started back in the mid-1980s when the species was first, fighting plover, was first federally listed as threatened, to roughly 680 pairs this past year. But again, we're still dealing with only about 1,800 pairs or less from right. the entire Atlantic coast. Right. And they're just restricted to this very narrow strip of habitat, which obviously is very um, highly coveted recreational habitat for people as well. Yeah. But I think it speaks to the success of the program and all the work that so many people have done over these years that we've had this amount of success coastwide and in Massachusetts specifically in the context of so much use of the coastal zone. And there's yeah. still a lot of people going to the beaches. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it sounds like there's a compromise, at least in terms of the beach, that I could see might be able to come to where, you know, we have a gradually, a longer extended beach in the front that is a gradual uprise, but not too high. Maybe some overwashes that allow them to have some flat surfaces, but not so much that the ocean ends up, you know, coming over and sort of taking over the, the barrier beach. It mm -hmm. seems like along the beach, there seems there, there could be a compromise. I still wonder what what is going to happen to the inlet sort of project or what what I mean I understand what you think is ideal for the the beach but mm -hmm. what about places where you have these inlets we're not the only ones that have one right. I mean and, and you've seen these problems I know you've seen them many many times in many situations that are probably somewhat similar mm -hmm. so how do you deal with with the problem that we have with the inlet um, or how have other communities dealt with that well I, that's where be interested to see what the new proposal is, and I would recommend that a dialogue with, with our agency, and in the case of piping plovers, I think the federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service should be brought into this as well, given this, that piping plovers are a federally list, listed species protected under the Federal Endangered Species right. Act as well. But start talking early on about whatever is going to be proposed for a new design. One of the other things, I mean, I, I, I have additional questions for the coastal engineers. Yeah. I mean, as I look at the old design, we talk about inlet being armored. As I recall, it also had a dredging component to it. So it's not clear in my, my mind how that is a good thing if by dredging you're actually increasing the volume of that opening coming into the salt marsh. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we saw today that a couple of the folks that were with us were quite struck by is a fairly low tide when we were out there. And there's a, a shoal or a bar that has built and basically extends the entire way across the entrance to the salt marsh. That wouldn't be visible at mid-tide or high-tide, but at low-tide it's very visible. 
So I would presume that is having some beneficial effect in terms of reducing the flow of water through that opening. Yeah. And presumably that bar has built as a result of some of the, or a lot of the erosion and movement of sand that we're talking about. Right. I think we, that's all we have time for, but I really want to thank you for coming on and being willing to share your insights and how we might find a balance between preserving our habitat and also protecting our beach, which I believe is one of the gems of Sandwich. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. And thank you for spending some time with us today.